Okay. Um, and so what she found was that the citrate transport inhibitor greatly um, decreased expression of inhibitory markers and increased um, cytokine production, which are both great things um, for your T cells. Um, and so you can see uh, the difference between this blue bar and this red bar showing cells with the inhibitor and without the inhibitor. You can see that those cells with the inhibitor express uh, much fewer um, inhibitory markers and therefore uh, appear less exhausted. And also you can see that there's an increase in cytokines. So there's more functional ability in these T cells with the inhibitor. And since uh, we saw that altering the fatty acid synthesis pathway did impact T cell exhaustion, this data suggests that there is a relationship between fatty acid synthesis and T cell exhaustion. And so knowing this and um, with the results that we had from citrate transporter, uh, we wanted to look at the next step in the fatty acid synthesis pathway, um, inhibiting acetyl-CoA. So that's what we did in the focus of our project is on uh, does inhibiting citrate-derived acetyl-CoA production impact the development of CDA-positive T cells? And so we set up a very similar um, assay to what was done with the citrate transporter, um, with the exception that, of course, our inhibitor here is different. The inhibitor that we used is an inhibitor of ATP citrate lyase, which is an enzyme that links citrate step to the acetyl-CoA um, synthesis. So by inhibiting ATP citrate lyase, we can limit acetyl-CoA production um, within the cell. And also we use this inhibitor at four different dosages because uh, the correct dosage is not as established previously. And so our first question with, with this new inhibitor was, does our inhibitor impact cell proliferation? With proliferation, of course, meaning um, cell growth and cell division. And so what we saw is that as inhibitor concentration increased, cell proliferation decreased, possibly due to metabolic stress on the cells from limiting acetyl-CoA. Um, and we also saw that chronically stimulated cells proliferated less than acutely stimulated cells, also due to there being more stress on chronically stimulated cells. And so the next thing we wanted to know was, does this inhibitor impact phenotypic markers of exhaustion? So we looked at TIM3 and PD1, as I mentioned before, um, and at all inhibitor concentrations, we didn't see any significant change in their expression on the T cells. And so the next question is, um, does our inhibitor impact um, T cell function? So its ability to produce cytokines is one of those functions. And so we looked at interferon gamma and TNF alpha, which are pro inflammatory cytokines that stimulate an immune response. And so in the lower left, you see our unsimilated control. Um, and I'll just use this image to set up our quadrants for you. Um, so the lower left-hand corner is the double negative corner. And so cells, which are represented by those dots in the lower left-hand corner, um, are producing low interferon gamma and low TNF alpha. And in the upper right-hand box, that's the double positive box and cells in that box are producing high interferon gamma and high TNF alpha. And so we want cells in the upper right-hand box. Um, and to just briefly introduce the method that we use to analyze cytokines, we performed intercellular staining for flow cytometry. So we took our cell, we activated it um, so that it would start produce, um, producing cytokines, and then we add a protein export inhibitor so all those cytokines stay inside the cell so that when you fix the cell, you kind of freeze it how it is and um, allow uh, antibodies to get into the cell. Those will bind the cytokines with a colored marker that you can see via flow cytometry so that we can analyze the amount of cytokines the cell is producing. Um, so now let's look at that cytokine data. And this was um, pretty interesting data that we uh, found. So we observed um, an increase in cytokine productions in cell groups treated with 40 micromolars of inhibitors or a highest inhibitor concentration. And so you can see in our duly stimulated cells with no inhibitor, um, there's around 47% high cytokine production then in our cells with 40 micromoles of inhibitor, that goes way up to about 60% of high cytokine production. And that difference is even greater in a chronically stimulated group, looking at the difference between our chronically stimulated cells with no inhibitor at about 5% high cytokine production versus over 50% high cytokine production with the highest inhibitor concentration, which is quite a significant jump. And that 50% is even greater than our least stressed, most controlled cell at acute stimulation with no inhibitor. Um, just to show you that in a different format, you can see that um, on this bar graph, there's a pretty clear upward jump at that 40 micromolar of inhibitor. And also notably, um, there's very little cytokine impact at the lower uh, doses, which kind of suggests that 
it's really this higher dosage that um, is producing an effect. Um, and so what does this all mean? So what we think from this is that our optimal inhibitor concentration is probably around 30 micromolars. And that's informed by both our growth curve data and our cytokine data. So wanting to still produce an impact on um, cytokines while making sure that cells are still able to proliferate. Um, and then also the cytokine data I just showed you suggests that inhibiting acetylcholine may impact um, CD8 T cell effector function. And of course, we would need more repeat testing to explain why these changes are happening. But something possible could be that our inhibitor is delaying T cell progression to terminally differentiate exhaustion um, by still maintaining functional capacity for T cells. And future directions that we have are to explore inhibiting other metabolites in the fatty acid synthesis pathway. So just as we went from citrate transporter to acetyl-CoA, going further down the line in fatty acid synthesis, um, also repeat testing under hypoxic conditions, because those are more similar to the tumor microenvironment, and then looking at other lenses of research like microscopy to see if we're actually um, decreasing the lipid accumulation, um, lipid droplet accumulation like we think we are, um, looking at in vivo mouse tumors. Um, and of course, the big picture of this all is to have a better understanding of um, how fatty acid metabolism plays a role in T cell exhaustion and to see if we can use what we learn to prevent T cells from reaching exhaustion and improve survival outcomes for cancer patients um, and possibly even development of supplements with this inhibitor that we can give patients down the line. And of course, um, I'd like to thank all the members of the Delgoff Lab so much for helping me uh, so much this summer. I've learned so much from them um, and all of the people from the Human Academy who put this program together. Thank you so much. I think uh, so. I'm just going to go back to that slide. For sure. So it's not necessarily like. 100% proven that like there's a direct correlation between the accumulation of lipids and exhaustion, but that's what we're seeing. And so I think just looking at these like microscopy images would be one way that you can kind of measure visually the size of those lipid accumulations. So, that's no, we have not looked at other um, cell types, um, but I think that would be interesting to see what other cells are impacted. Mm -hmm. So I've been told that those on Zoom um, are not seeing slideshow go by. Slides are not in the presentation mode. Sorry, let me see if I can fix that. Um, next up, we have Marcus. Hi, I'm Jordan. Um, I'm a PhD student from the Turnquist lab, and I'm um, studying how macrophage function and uh, repair mechanisms are altered by uh, transplanted materials. And I'm proud to introduce Marcus Waller, who has helped me this summer um, in developing assays to look at how transplanted materials alters the metabolism of macrophages. And so we did a lot of cell culture this summer and whether it be multiple lines of macrophages, fibroblasts, it always turned out amazing. And so that's why I'm presenting Marcus with the uh, for being macrophage. So there you go. Um, and he's excited to show his project. He generated some very good data in a very short amount of time. And so uh, take it away.
Thanks for the introduction, even though that was very corny. Um, but yeah, like you said, I'm Marcus, um, and I work with Gordon over the summer in the Frankness Lab. And my project was defining how recognition of L antigen shapes um, macrophage and you know, metabolism. So I just threw a bunch of words in you in my title alone. So let's kind of break that down a little bit. So first, we're macrophages. Macrophages are phagocytic um, white blood cells or immune cells. So <clears throat> they consume um, any antigens that enter your body and they're a part of the innate immune system. But they also have a second function, um, and that is to be reparative, and they help restore any damage um, done by the um, inflammation. So what differentiates these two types? Um, it depends on what cytokines they are surrounded in in their environment. Like all other immune cells, um, they need to be activated by cytokines. So some that make them pro-inflammatory macrophages or type 1 are LPS and interferon gamma, um, whereas reparative macrophages are um, differentiated um, with IL-4 or interleukin-4. Um, <clears throat> and then what we were looking at is their differences in metabolism. So pro-inflammatory macrophages primarily utilize glucose glycolysis, um, which is essentially breaking down glucose um, into energy, um, whereas the reparative macrophages uh, use fatty acids and fatty acid oxidation. So we wanted to look at how uh, these two macrophages were uptaking um, these two materials and if that um, we could determine if their um, metabolism was altered at any point. So for pro-inflammatory, we're looking at GLUT1, which is um, where the glucose enters the cell, and then C36, which is a protein on the out, um, outer cell of the wall as well to let the fatty acid in, but also CPT1A, which is in the mitochondria um, where the TCA cycle of fatty acid oxidation occurs and which is a part of. And then, so what we're trying to answer is how does this metabolism differentiate not, no, not only when these macrophages um, are, there are two different types, but also when they're in the presence of allogeneic or syngeneic material. And so, what's syngeneic versus allogeneic to begin with? So syngeneic is anything self, whereas allogeneic is anything non-self. So if you were to receive a transplant from someone, it's, it would likely be allogeneic as there are differences in the major histocompatibility complex on the outside of the cell. And so what Jordan did in the past was he implanted, implanted um, Splenocytes from BALC mice into B6 mice, um, into their peritoneal cavity, um, just because that's where a lot of the macrophages are, uh, to observe what differences there were. Um, and then this was run on flow cytometry to um, see which um, cells were positive for different pro-inflammatory or imperative markers. So for the pro-inflammatory, they're looking at CD86, Ly6C, in INOS, um, whereas for reparative, they were looking at CD206 and CD301B. Um, and overall, uh, the immune recognition of adaptive and innate cells of transplanted allogenes mediates organ rejection. Um, so again, back to its important. So the result of his experiment were here, if you look at the bottom left um, in the red box, um, the allogenic materials, which are again, non-self, um, expressed more lysis in CD86, which were markers for glucose. So uptaking a lot of glucose and likely using glycolysis. Whereas um, in the CD206 and CD301B samples, which were um, reparative, um, they uptook very little um, fatty acids compared to syngen uh, the syngeneic and the um, no treatment cells. So our hypothesis that macrophage recognition of allogenic materials uh, results in metabolic reprogramming, supporting pro-inflammatory macrophage differentiation, while eliminating metabolic pathways needed for reparative generation. And all that sums up basically just saying when macrophages are surrounded by allogenic materials, again, not self, um, then they'll be pro-inflammatory and primarily utilize glycolysis. So our goals for this project were to develop a slow cytometry-based assay to quantify rate-limiting metabolic enzymes in macrophage subsets at the single cell level, as well as use this assay to compare how macrophages um, exposed to allogeneic and syngeneic materials in vitro um, differ from one another. 
So our first method was using microscopy, um, which is essentially just cell imaging under a microscope. So we started with our bone marrow derived macrophages and we treated them with our two conditions, LPS interfering gamma, and then PIL4 to differentiate them to two types. Then we stained with three fluorescent markers, GAPI, which is just for the nucleus of the cell, two NDBT, which is an analog of glucose, and then BODIPI, which is a fatty acid. And we were looking at how they were updating the cell and you see in the next slide um, what that looks like. And then we moved on to flow cytometry and we applied the allogeneic and syntonic um, conditions as well. And then the markers we were looking at here were GLUT1, CD36, and CPC1A. So this is from the microscopy. You can see in the no treatment that there is a high expression of the DAPI, which is just um, staining the nucleus of the cell. So we know the cells are there, but they're not very um, active, metabolically speaking, because um, there's very little red and green present. Um, and that is expected. And of course, when you move to the con treated conditions of LPS interfering gamma, there's more beta metabolic activity. Um, and more importantly, there's more 2-NDBG, which is the glucose of analog, I mean, analog of glucose, um, which is expected for pro-inflammatory macrophages. Um, but what's a little interesting was that IO-4 um, was also expressing more of this glucose rather than BODIPI, the fatty acid. Um, but it's important to note is that it was still expressing more BODIPI than um, the, the pro-inflammatory macrophages. So these differences in metabolic processes aren't black and white. They're still both going to utilize glycolysis and fatty acid oxidation. It's just how much they rely on each. So moving on to flow cytometry, um, on the far left, we have GLUT1 again. Um, so these pro-inflammatory um, macrophages with LPS and interferon gamma Y at the bottom expressed a lot more GLUT1 <clears throat> than a lot of the other cells, which was what we expected. Um, but what's important to note is that the allogeneic and syngeneic, um, but there wasn't really much of a difference between them. Um, they were still relatively close to the no treatment. So then we looked at CD36 and the allogeneic and syngeneic both decreased, but syngeneic decreased more. Um, but then when you look at the CPT1A, which is another fatty acid marker, syngeneic actually was producing a lot more of that than um, most of the samples. Um, and there was a decrease for the allogeneic materials. And then going back to CD36, um, the IL-4, as expected, um, produce, uh, produced a lot of it. Um, and then that was the same for IL-4 with the CPT1A. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Um, in the presence of CPT1A, allogeneic, um, uh, macrophages and surrounded by allogeneic materials um, had a decrease in fatty acid oxidation, um, whereas syngeneic um, had an increase. And then in terms of C36, as I mentioned before, allogeneic um, expressed more of it, but they're relatively the same for um, GLUT1. So what we can determine from this is that um, there is a difference between syngenetic and allogeneic materials in terms of their fatty acid metabolism. Um, and there's still a reliance for both of them, but it's just how that may differ. So in future directions, um, here in the red, unlike in the yellow, which were the ones we focused on, um, we are different, looking at other different markers, um, such as ASS1 and IDH2. Um, to see if there are any differences with those to um, further validate that there is a difference in their um, meta metabolism of lipids. Um, and then targeting um, the pro targeting to promote the repair of macrophage generation and then observing these differences as well in vivo. Um, and then trying to optimize these conditions in vitro like we have been doing, um, such as making sure um, how long we uh, treat each cell with, because um, currently we only did it for a day. Um, we were wondering if there would be any differentiation on which how much was expressed later on. Um, so I just want to acknowledge um, Keith um, for taking on a student this summer um, and helping me, and then Jordan, of course, um, with all of our experiments and me asking a bunch of questions all the time. Um, Dr. Boone, Solomon, Stephen, Dr. Bruno, and Dr. Dogoff 
putting this all together. And then Bridie and Stephanie um, were also a big help during all of our sessions. So thanks for that. Um, okay. Are there any questions? Um, so on the outside of the cells, there are proteins called major histocompatibility histo complexes. Um, and so when they bind to each other, um, if they don't match, then they recognize that cell is foreign. Um, and then they um, produce a pro-inflammatory response <clears throat> to try to kill that foreign entity. Uh, and then do you know where the source of bio cells normally in the uh, microbiome? Um, most cytokines are produced by other immune cells. I'm just not sure which exact immune cell produces it. Uh, so, I think you should look at IAM cytokines. Yeah. Uh, so, what else could they be doing with fatty acids? Any ideas? Um, there are other pathways. We were thinking they might be using it for um, synthesis of different materials in the cell, um, or again, like you mentioned, storage. Um, so, in my opinion, these patients usually have higher levels of serotonin and glucose. So, is there any data that suggests they're more likely to be um, none that I know of that definitely would be interesting to look at. Okay. Okay. Julian is next. Hi, good morning, everyone. Is Ilian next? Yes, Ilian is up next. Okay, so I will, I guess, be introducing Ilian, but Ilian is remote, so he's joining via Zoom. Okay, great. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, does he need to share his presentation? Uh, yes, Ilian, you can go ahead and share your screen, maybe. If you can. Oh, great. Okay, yep. so I will give a very brief uh, introduction to Ilian. So uh, I'm Jishnu Das. I'm uh, in immunology and computational systems biology. Uh, Ilian uh, worked in my lab over the summer. It was fantastic having someone as talented and motivated as Ilyan working in the lab uh, with a graduate student, Swapnil, who's also on the Zoom call. Uh, Ilyan really exceeded all expectations, uh, working on an exciting and a difficult project, looking at the effect of uh, COVID-19 on scientific collaboration networks. And I will hand it over to Ilyan, but it was truly a pleasure to have him in the lab. And I gave him the nickname Monty Python for very obvious. Hello, my name is Ilyan Nazarelli, and my project is understanding the effect of COVID-19 on scientific collaboration networks. So I will be explaining a little bit about networks and centrality measures of networks. So as you can see from the illustration over here, you can see two different important features of a network. The two important features of a network are nodes and edges. Um, as you can see, one, two, three, four, and five are all nodes, and there are various edges in these nodes, and this, and this um, foundation basically makes up a network. And there are also various um, centrality features of a network which can use to determine various characteristics of a network. The first um, centrality features between the centrality, and this can be used to find the, um, uh, uh, like the shortest path 
between two nodes. As you can see here um, in node number eight, it has a high between the centrality um, because it connects many different nodes together. Whereas node two has a very low between the centrality because it does not connect that many nodes together. So between the centrality, it tells you more about the connect, um, what nodes are particular connectors in a network. The next centrality measure, which I use in my project, is degree centrality. Degree centrality tells you how many edges there are of a particular node, and it can be used to determine how central a particular node is in a network. And the third feature comprises of your authority score and your hub score is the hub centrality. And this is basically um, authority score and hub score are basically the in degree of a network of, an, of a particular node and the out degree of a particular node. The in degree of particular um, of this node K is two because uh, because in degree measures how many um, nodes from this particular node is uh, um, is I and J pointing towards, and out degree measures how many nodes um, from the uh, um, it measures the exact opposite. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use network score to analyze the effect of COVID-19 on the scientific community. What effect did COVID have on publications? Um, and authors and the and the really connections and basically the collaborations between the authors. My hypothesis is that COVID nineteen is going to impact science collaborations by leading to more collabor by leading to more collaborations because it moved to more virtual platforms, which will facilitate ease into um into collaborating more. And so what I was first given I was a, a list of sixty thousand papers of hundred journals. And what we did is that we filtered this. We filtered this first thing that um that was done before I got this list that was filtered, and um and it was like um it was filtered before I got the list, and then I had eventually the edge list of different journals from um Cell, Nature, POS, and many different journals from biology related research for different stages of the pandemic, which um 2019 corresponds to pre-pandemic phase, 2020 corresponds to the during the pandemic phase, during the initial stages of the pandemic, and 2021 corresponds to the post-pandemic phase. Um, and what I was able to do with this data is I was able to calculate various centrality measures for. I was able to model the number of co-authors and publications or to isolate in order to see how standalone authors and authors that work in consortiums were impacted um, throughout those three years by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now I was able to look at this, um, how COVID-19 impacted different continents in a geographic lens in order to, by calculating whether the percentage of edges for research was done within the continent and presented research was done between two different continents. And so here's my um, data plot for between the centrality. As you can see here, between the centrality is less than um, 80,000 in 2019. Um, for, like if you look at the x-axis represents the various between the centralities, and the y-axis represents the frequency of what that between the centrality occurs in the data. And as you can see here, there, there is about less than 8,000 small between the centrality values. But in 2020, if you look here, that value gets even more um, bigger. It gets up to more than 80,000. And in 2021, that between the centrality value gets up to uh, even more. It gets up to 100,000. Um, 100, and, and we can conclude from this data that between its centrality increased about three years, indicating those less bridges and network to connect many different nodes, many different authors, indicating those less connectivity between authors. Similar finding was found for hub centrality. Hub centrality throughout all the three years too is indicated by the x-axis representing the hub centrality and the y-axis representing the frequency of what the hub centrality occurs. And as you can see here, um, there is also an increase in really small hub centrality values, indicating that hub centrality decreased across all of three years, indicating there was a decrease in the author's collaboration circles, indicating a decrease in connectivity. And degree centrality also decreased across three years, indicating there was a decrease in authors who the authors were previously collaborating with, as indicated by the X axis representing different degree centralities. And the y-axis represents the frequency uh, as indicated before. And also, um, I was able to plot the difference between, um, between the number of co-authors and the publication count for every author. As you can see in these graphs, x-axis 
represents the number of authors a particular author was working it, working with, and the y-axis represents the various uh, publication count of the authors. The dots represent the individual authors. So um, I was able to track how consortiums were impacted by the COVID-19 because where the characteristic of consortiums is that they have a high number of co-authors and they have a low number of publications. So consortiums are typically found in the fourth quadrant of the um, of this graph. As you can see in 2019, uh, many authors were working in consortiums, um, but then when you go to 20, when we go to 2020, we see there are few dots in the quadrant four indicating there was a consortiums were impacted by um, COVID-19. But if we look in 2021, we see a little bit more dots than there was in 2020, indicating that consortiums started to gain some ground in, for, in towards the, um, 2021. And here are my various intra-continent counts of, of the different continents, the x-axis represents the varying continents, the y-axis represents the percent of edges in which that research was within the continent or it was between two different continents. And as you can see, Asia, North America, Europe, and Africa, they all, their intercontinent counts, the research that was happening between two different co continents was decreased and their, and their intracontinent counts was increasing, indicating they were doing research more within their own continent than with other continents. And if you look at South America and Oceania, like let's look at South America first. If we see there, um, if we see from 2019 to 2020, we can see their, um, you can see their uh, intracontinent count decrease while their intercontinent count increased, indicating that there was more research done within continents in 20, in, um, towards the beginning stage of the pandemic. And then, and then uh, we can see that that uh, intra count uh, increased again, and I mean increase is decreased, but then it increased in South America in 2021, but then it decreased again in, in South America in um in tw and towards 2021, indicating there was more recent there was um there was a change in research that it was done. Um, more research was done in like um within um, starting to be done it within the continent. As you can see, there's various other findings for Oceania, for Oceania is, is contrasting for Oceania. And here's my conclusion. The, cent the very centrality measures, the consortium, intercontinent collaborations in Asia, North America, and Europe, they all decreased. Um, and Oceania also intercontinent collaborations decreased in 2019 and 2020. But then it started to gain ground in 2021, those intercontinent collaborations. And an interesting case that I found was that in South America, intercontinent collaboration in 2019 and 2020, they increased while the, all the other intercontinent collaborations of all the other continents, they decreased. But then, but then in South America in 2021, it, it was decreased, it started decreasing in, 20, in um, 2021. So here are my future directions. So I'm going to look at data from 2022 to see if those findings hold consistent um, uh, with our findings I found right now uh, related to how COVID impacted in the various years. And I'm going to look at other journals um, in other science areas rather than from topics related to biology related research. And I'm going to look at other um, important measures, but particularly this allergy vector, which can determine which authors and journals are common across all these three years. And I like to thank various members of the Hillman Academy, including Dr. Boone, Stephen Jones and Solomon Lipschitz and Dr. Bruno. And I'd like to thank Dr. Das for his continuous support as a PI throughout the project. And I'd like to thank Swap Nokasari for his help and guidance throughout this project. And I'd like to thank my family for their support and dedication to my progress. And I'd like to thank the NIH YES program for funding my project and thank you everybody. That was fantastic, Ilian. So thank you so much. This it was a pleasure having you in the lab, and it really I think the presentation reflects the great work that you did with complex network science concepts. So that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dr. I can Dad. see your question if they can't hear it. All right, maybe you can repeat it. Uh, so it's actually a relatively small data set, just three years. You don't know what the trend was between 2010. 2019 or 2000 and 2010. Do you think that maybe the changes you're seeing are actually not attributable to COVID-19, just actually a difference? 
in the purpose and in our action between offers? Did you hear that? No, they didn't hear that. Okay, so the question essentially, do you want to come up and speak into the microphone or shall I repeat it? Because it was long. Okay, he's coming up to the microphone. Thanks. So your data set is actually relatively small, just three years, 2019, 2021. What about looking backwards uh, to 2010 to 2019 or 2000 to 2010 and see what the trends were in terms of changes from year to year, their geographic locations, and among others? Yeah, I can definitely um, look at trends from, uh, from 2010. And we can maybe see, like, um, I can do further research on, like, trends, and I can look at further data from 2019 and see if those trends were consistent, or it was just, like, those trends for um, those 2019, 2020, and 2021 were just, like, um, were, were very unique because of COVID. You can, you can definitely look at that. <clears throat> um, I have another question for you. Did you try to... What's that? <laughs> I think I'm close enough. Um, as far as uh, the types of publications that you were looking at, could you break it down into the type, um, or the type of publication, like a review versus a clinical report versus like a scientific peer-reviewed article? And maybe you see that there were less primary research articles and more reviews written, or that they tended to be in more clinical type journals since there is so much of a hubbub about COVID-19. Is that another stratum that you could use to look at your data? Yes, we can definitely look at, um, I can, my further research could be on the, um, looking at various, um, various um, differences between journals. I can, um, and in this research, I didn't look at that, but I can look further um, on those differences. Awesome, okay. Thank you for the presentation. Next up is Grace Kettler from our lab. Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Grace Kettler. She rotated in our lab, which is the laboratory of Tulia Bruno. Um, and we do a lot of B cell tumor immunology. So Grace arrived here. Um, it was really fun the entire time. Uh, Grace asked a ton of really good questions and she always apologizes for that. But I say, keep them coming because the more she asked questions, the more I thought critically about my project and had to review some information and think about, okay, what are our assumptions for doing this? And that's always a great exercise. So you helped build up the, the scientific approach and the theoretical approach to the projects. Um, Grace is like a soccer celebrity, apparently, and also a ranking member of the student council, something like that, president, perhaps? President. Okay, great. So um, yeah, she's off to a great start and she's considering coming back next year as well. So very proud of the work that you did and thank you for helping push our progress forward. And the certificate here, um, we dubbed you the B cell phenotyping phenom, which I think is appropriate. So, without further ado. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grace Kettler, and thank you for watching my presentation. This summer, I spent my time in the Bruno lab, which works with B cells and immunotherapy, which is manipulating the immune system to fight cancer. And my mentor was Dr. Ian McFawn, who um, specializes with immunotherapy of ovarian cancer. So my project was kind of a um, build off of that, which leads me to interrogating B-cell function in the ascites of patients with high-grade serious ovarian cancer. So before I get into the details of my project, I wanted to just give some background on ovarian cancer. 
21,000 women a year in the United States are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and the five-year survival rate for high-grade serous is 47.4% for five years in the United States. Um, it's a tricky one because it's typically aggressive and it's hard to catch. Um, it usually starts in the fallopian tubes and then will move down and kind of plant in the ovaries in a way. Um, and it's typically caught in stages three and four, which makes it hard to work with. And this is why there's a definite need to develop immunotherapies to improve these statistics. One place that ovarian cancer spreads is into in front of the abdomen, and it creates a fluid called ascites fluid. Um, ascites fluid is generally unknown. It's not... Um, completely understood, but we do know that there are tumor cells, immune cells, and stromal cells present. Uh, it's typically only present in stages three and four and is one of the first symptoms people uh, feel, so that is why it is hard to understand. But you can see in this image that by the time uh, it reaches stage four, 100% of patients have ascites fluid. An interesting thing about ovarian cancer in general is that 40% of high-grade serous have B cells, and that is what my project is working with to capitalize on their presence. So what are B cells? B cells are a type of immune cell that are really good at producing antibodies. So whenever they find an antigen or something that they know they need to um, get rid of, they produce an antibody and then will give that to a cell that can kill cancer. And so they're really important in the process of uh, fighting cancer. And specifically, B cells are really um, in depth with differentiation and they change and specify into a specific type of B cell throughout their life. So they usually start as naive B cells, which means that they don't have memory of an antigen. Um, but whenever they are met with the antigen that they know they need to get rid of, they become activated. And once that happens, as their life goes on, they specify into a specific type of B cell. The bottom path, affinity maturation, uh, they become a memory B cell is one option. And memory B cells are really important because there's a ton of different types of memory B cells. And once they gain memory, um, anytime they meet an antigen that they've already seen before, they have memory for it, and they're able to continue to produce antibodies over and over again. Um, it's proven that incre increased B cells in general are, uh, and plasma cells result in better survival with ovarian cancer. And plasma cells are sort of like a branch off of memory cells. So once they're memory cells, they can differentiate even, even further into something called a plasma blast. And that pretty much means they are short-lived, but they continuously produce and produce and produce antibodies, and then they die. But they can even turn into plasma cells, which means they're pretty much like a master memory B cell, and they are long-lived, and they are kind of in retirement in the body until they uh, find an antigen that they have memory for. And anytime they see it, they're ready to attack. So uh, we wanted to understand what type of B cells are in ascites fluid so that we can capitalize on them. So to do that, we use this machine called the Cytec Aurora, and we took ascites fluid from different patients and stained it and ran it through this machine. So how that works is we put the cells through this little um, tunnel in a way and stain them for different antibodies that they possibly could have. And if they did, uh, whenever they went through the tunnel and the laser beam, they emitted a bright light that we saw on our computer when we analyzed them using flow cytometry. And that's how you're able to understand what type of cells are in ascites fluid. This is something called a gating strategy. This is how we got to all of our results. And pretty much what it is is um, narrowing down cells more and more into what we wanted, which is what different types of B cells we have. So you start out real simple on the top left, just getting lymphocytes, immune cells, everything that's not in there is something else, whether it's tumor cells or anything else. And then you go down into single cells, alive cells, and you just keep narrowing it down more and more until you can get to spe specify what type of B cells are in ascites fluid. 
um, we didn't just stain the slightest fluid. We also stained um, controls. So we started with a healthy donor tonsil and tonsils are a really good immune system spot. Um, the top left corner of each graph is showing how many plasma blasts and plasma cells are in each sample. So for the tonsil, they have a decent amount. And then the middle one is healthy donor blood. Um, not much plasma blasts. Most of their categories are in the bottom. So memory cells and naive cells. And then on the bottom left is the ascites fluid staining. So they're more similar to the blood staining compared to the tonsil. Um, however, they do produce a lot of memory B cells rather than naive, which is good. So we wanted to ask the question, how does ascites fluid impact the process of B cell differentiation and activation? So to do that, um, sorry, before that, my hypothesis was that they would change into memory B cells just because since it's so unknown, I figured that the cells had not had memory for the ascites fluid before they entered it. So we did that um, by whenever a blood bag came into the lab, we used something called a buffy coat and separated the densities to separate white blood cells and red blood cells. Then we used a magnetic kit to separate memory B cells and naive B cells so that we could study the process of both. And then we plated half of those with ascites fluid um, from different patients. And then we plated the other half with a control called media, which is pretty much um, blood. And then we treated all of those with this simulation master mix on the left. It's a mixture of different um, chemicals and growth factors that is going to force them to turn into plasma blast plasma cells. Obviously, patients don't have this going in their body. So we knew it would be different than the staining for regular ascites fluid. But this forced them to differentiate into plasma cells in a realistic time, time frame. And then at day zero, four, and seven, we stain them on the uh, Cytec Aurora and use flow cytometry to understand what the cells differentiated into or what they turned into over time. We saw pretty constant results through our whole experiment in favor of ascites fluid. So before we even got into the differentiation and what they turned into, we wanted to just look at how many there were. Each cell um, plate started with the same amount of cells, 40,000 cells. However, as time went on, we counted them at day seven, and there was way more cells in ascites fluid produced compared to the media, more than tripled for naive B cells. And it also went along with their percent high division. So high division pretty much just means they're really good at dividing and making more of themselves um, to help the immune system. And it was a pretty dramatic result here. So the blue, the ascites fluid had 80% of cells in high division dividing really fast while um, the cells in the media pretty much had none. This also went along with their viability. So on the left, this is an example of the flow cytometry plot for their viability. So the ones that are in the box are alive and the other ones are dead. So in the red for the media, only 7% were alive by day four. And in ascites fluid on the bottom, 61% were alive. So it's a pretty dramatic um, result in favor of ascites fluid. And I graphed. Um, more than just this one sample on the left, I graphed all of them to see if the results were consistent. And they definitely were, no matter if it was naive or memory B cell, um, the cells in ascites fluid had much better viability, more were alive as time went on compared to the media. At this point, I'm looking at what they did change into going past just the quantity amounts. So this is explaining the different types of B cells that were in the ascites in the media. The box that we wanted to look at is the top left box, uh, the PVPC, which is plasma blast plasma cell. And this is just saying what percent of them have already differentiated and changed into plasma cells in the plasma blast. And the red, the media, um, only 24%, you can see the box isn't very filled. However, on the bottom box, the blue and the ascites fluid, 65% had already changed into plasma blast. 
And I also graphed this just to make sure the results were consistent. And um, no matter how many cells there were in general, there was always more plasma blast in ascites fluid compared to the media, which is interesting. Then we took it one step further and we looked at how many plasma cells there were. So as I said earlier, once they become a plasma blast, they can go even further into a plasma cell. So we took the amount of plasma blasts on the graph and looked even further into that population and stained those to see how many of those were plasma cells. And for media, um, there were none, which was pretty um, consistent. And then for the ascites fluid of the, all of the plasma blasts, about 50% of those were already plasma cells, which is um, a lot different than the media and showed that ascites fluid really helped out the process of differentiation. differentiation. And I also graphed this um, just to show that no matter what sample you looked at, the results are always going to be consistent. That ascites fluid definitely um, helps the process of B cells. So um, consistent results across the board, ascites fluid, the B cells in it um, live, live longer, they produce more, they change faster, they had more plasma cells in ascites fluid compared to a control like media um, acting as blood. And although B cells in ascites fluid from patients do not currently have plasma blasts, um, I think that would be a step forward into something we could do next. So I think it'd be interesting to understand how we can um, create something like we used for the stimulation master mix in the ascites fluid um, a way to put that into patients so that we could force their B cells to turn into plasma cells since they don't do that on their own. On top of that, I think it'd be interesting to do even a larger stage scale panel of ascites fluid to understand why the B cells do so much better in ascites fluid compared to the control um, to understand what's driving them to need to be so much better. And I also think It'd be interesting. Ascites fluid isn't only present in ovarian cancer, it's also present in other diseases such as liver disease. It's just not cancerous. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to compare the ascites fluid and the B cells in it um, of liver disease to ovarian cancer to see if more widespread treatment could be used or if they're very different. Um, I'd I'd like to thank Dr. McFawn for a very good experience this summer. I learned a lot and for Dr. Bruno for this opportunity and for all of her help along the way. I'd like to thank Cheryl Cunning and Asia Williams for all of the skills that they taught me and their patients with me this summer. And I'd like to thank all of the other members of the Bruno Lab and Friday and Stephanie for uh, their lectures and their help with my presentation. I'd especially like to thank my family for just being supportive this summer. Um, and my mom for driving me down and back every day. I really appreciated it. And I'd like to thank my grandparents for coming today. And I'd also like to honor my neighbor, Lori. She is an ovarian cancer survivor. These are my references. Um, so I think it's good that the B cells have um, high proliferation, but obviously that probably means that there's bad stuff in there that is making them need to create more of themselves. So I'm thinking that there is um, other things that the tumor cells are creating um, other than just themselves that is non-self that the body does not like. Um, I just think it's interesting that ascites fluid is created from liver disease because most of the time it's non-cancerous. So I think it's a 
interesting concept that non-cancerous um, diseases can also present ascites fluid because it's specific to ovarian cancer. So I think it'd be cool to understand why. Um, I think just because my lab specializes in B cells, but I think it'd be interesting to also study other cells to see if we could um, get a more widespread idea. Um, no, we did not. The ascites fluid that we used for the staining the tumor cells were removed. Um, and that's why I think that there are other antigens other than just the tumor cells that they're still reacting to. So um, I think that they're reacting to something other than the tumor cells. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. So at this time we have a 15 minute break. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. So hello everyone again, my name is Jenna and I have the honor of working Dr. Ferris's lab, um, conducting research on TNF for tube expression on BRAF, mutated melanomas that mediates TNF driven resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. So melanoma is the most lethal form of skin cancer that develops in the cells that produce melanin that's responsible for roughly 80% of skin cancer related deaths. In fact, it is estimated, okay, in fact, an estimated 90% of melanomas can be directly attributed to UV radiation because of this exposure, mutations are more likely to occur. One of the most lethal common mutations in melanoma is the BRAF protein. Approximately 50% of melanoma cases carry a BRAF mutation, which is a key protein kinase in the metagen activated protein kinase, MAPK, signaling pathway, which leads to oncogenic programming and pre malignant melan sites. So, how exactly does BRAF um, mutations occur? The BRAF mutation is a change in a BRAF gene. That change in the gene can lead to the alteration in a protein that regulates cell growth that could allow the melanoma to grow more aggressively. The BRAF gene ultimately leads to uncontrolled cell signaling. Approximately 50% of melanoma harm mutations at position 600 of the BRAF gene, B600, the majority of which involve the substitution of valine by glutamic acid, B600E, resulting in contributing active BRAF. As shown in the figure, when receptor tyrosine kinase, RTK, starts signaling, they initiate a cascade of events. RTK downstream signaling in BRAF B600E, which leads to uncontrolled cell proliferation, extended cell survival, and ultimately cancer. The BRAF mutation can ultimately lead to the constitutive activation and signaling of MAP kinase inhibitors, which is a chemotherapy treatment used to treat melanoma patients. However, 80% of those who receive MAP kinase inhibitor therapy perform very well initially, but then relapse and become resistant to MEK inhibitors. MAP kinase targeting therapies are limited by resistant mechanisms that can be directly induced by TNF released by tumor associated microphages. So, microphages within BRAF melanoma tumors produce tumor necrosis factor TNF, which is a major pro inflammatory and immunoregulatory cytokine that is commonly associated with inflammation, autoimmune disease, and cancer. TNF can avoid pathway inhibitors by blocking apoptosis and allowing for continuous proliferation. It is able to perform this action through multiple pathways, including MAP kinase. Because of this signaling of TNF, the soluble form has multiple tumor um, organic forms, including enhancing primary tumor growth, facilitating metastatic spread, immunosuppression, and promoting drug resistance. So looking at the figure on the right, we can see that TNF comes in two different forms, transmembrane and soluble TNF. These two different forms of TNF pro-signal different receptors. Soluble TNF signaling primarily occurs through TNFR1, whereas transmembrane exclusively signals via TNFR2. However, soluble TNF can also bind to TNFR2 with low affinity. TNFR1 generally mediates apoptosis, cell survival, and cytokine secretion, while TNFR2 selectively mediates only cell survival and cytokine secretion. While TNFR1 ex is expressed on most cell types, TNFR2 expression is predominantly described on immune cells. 
From previous studies, it has been shown that TNF-R2 expression has been reported on melanoma cell lines, and in particular, soluble TNF can induce resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. However, little is known about how these two receptors um, mediate this mechanism to be RAP inhibitors. To gain a better understanding on how different TNF receptors affect melanoma's ability to acquire resistance to BRAF and MEK inhibitors, I have included numerous slides of preliminary data which helped lay the foundation of my project. Previous literature suggested that all BRAF mutant cell lines exposed to TNF acquire resistance to BRAF and MEK inhibitors and microscopy showed TNF-R2 expression was elevated in melanoma patients receiving inhibitor treatment. On that basis, it was demonstrated that some cell lines, like SKML37, could favorably respond to TNF treatments. However, others, such as SKML28, could not respond at all. Therefore, we can observe that some cell lines expressed TNF for two while others did not. What we observed is that there's a direct correlation between the level of expression of either of these receptors with the ability of cells to acquire resistance to MAP kinase um, inhibitors. To confirm our observation, as shown in the figures, SKML37 cell variants had TNF-R1 or TNF-R2 knocked out to look at their sensitivity to TNF-induced resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. Sensitivity of knockout variants of the cell line were compared to the unmodified line. We showed that both receptors are needed for the signaling pathway to occur. It is evident that co-expression of TNF-R1 and TNF-R2 on SKML37 cell lines is required for soluble TNF-induced MAP kinase resistance. In this figure, we are measuring the color and in this figure, we are measuring the color intensity on melanoma 28 unmodified wild type cell lines that express high TNF-R2. Looking at the wild type graph in the middle, we can see that there is no distinct difference between the two figures. However, as shown in the TNFR2 knock-in graph, on the right, there is an overexpression of TNFR2, which leads to BRAF and MEK inhibitor resistance. Therefore, the loss of sensitivity suggests that following pretreatment with TNF, the TNFR2 expressing cell line require resistance to the soluble TNF and MEK inhibitor mediated cell killing. To conclude, the preliminary data in animal fluorescent microscopy was conducted from melanoma patient samples receiving MAP kinase pathway inhibitors plus an interferon gamma, which contributes to the upregulation of MAP kinase pathways and immunosuppression. DAPI was used for DNA labeling the nucleus, and um, SOK10 is a protein expressed by melanocytes in melanoma. To provide some context of the graph, the, data, the top graph represents the percentage of melanoma cells expressing TNF-R2, and on the bottom, it shows um, the mean expression levels of TNF-R2 in melanoma cells. So when we took tumor secretion sections from melanoma patients treated with BRAF inhibitors, we saw increased frequencies of TNF-R2 cells after the treatment. These data suggest that BRAF inhibitors may be enriched for TNF-R2 positive melanoma as a possible resistance mechanism. This is important because it indicates that it can be a reductible resistance mechanism. So this project is a continuation of previous studies um, investigated by my mentor. We have submitted a paper and received um, comments from the reviewer. The reviewer suggested that we validate TNF-R2 expression on the TNF-2 knock-in cell line by IF microscopy, examine whether BRAF, BRAF and MEK inhibitor treatments leads to relation of TNF, R2 and on TNF are negative B rap mutated melanoma cell lines. From the reviewers' comments in past studies, we were able to form a hypothesis that B rap and MEK inhibitors will not cause upregulation of TNF R1 on a B rap mutated melanoma cell line. Instead, it will be interferon gamma, a very important cytokine produced by TNK cells. So the results shown by this figure show that TNFR2 KISK mal 28 cell line displays TNFR2 translocation to cell membrane. This is proven by using immunofluorescent microscopy as shown to visualize the protein of interest in its cellular context by staining cells with antibodies. DAPI was used to determine the number of nuclei and to assess growth cell morphology. From this figure, we can conclude um, that there were high levels of protein on the cell membrane as shown in the bottom middle figure in green. This indicates that the protein is getting translocated to the cell surface where it can engage TNF. The composite image followed shows a nuclear stain. 
So the experimental um, approach in my project was conducted in three major steps. The first step of the experiment was to identify TNFR2 negative BRAV B600E cell lines, which included cell line SKML28. The second step was to use a six well plate and seed wild type cell lines for an overnight culture in paraformaldehyde. This was because it killed the cells and crosslink cells on the surface. We treated these cell lines using BRAF and MEK inhibitors, as well as interferon gamma and short cultures. We used a 48 hour treatment of, of wild type cells um, lines to see if they remotely express TNFR2 upregulation. So how exactly does interferon gamma play a role in TNF? Well, TNF and interferon gamma work together. Several papers and studies have shown that BRAF meek inhibitors promote increased tumor filtration by various immune cell types, including T cells and microphages. These cell types can produce TNF. These inhibitors also enhance interferon gamma released by T cells and NK cells. If we have increased immune infiltration and interferon gamma secretion within tumors, we get higher expression of TNFR2 on melanoma cells, which then enhances TNF-resistant pathways. Lastly, we also use flow cytometry to test whether TNFR2 expression is induced in response to these treatments. To continue, the results shown from this figure indicate that BRAF and MEK inhibitors do not induce TNFR2 expression on SKML28, but interferon gamma treatment does. In other words, interferon gamma leads to the upregulation of TNFR2 and melanoma, while TNF leads to the induction of resistance to these inhibitors. As shown by the graph, there's a less than 10% difference. The untreated is negative control and the TNFR2 KI is positive control. The reason we use interferon gamma is because the cytokine can induce expression resistance on melanoma. Furthermore, these BRAF inhibitors seem to promote tumor infiltration in melanoma and interferon gamma. Therefore, we can conclude that the cells can be more receptive to TNF treatments, allowing them to be more resistant to these therapies. Overall, based on what we have seen in our cultures, melanomas can express TNFR2 consecutively, but they're also going to be TNFR2 negative. Those that are negative, when it's stimulated by interferon gamma, have shown to upregulate TNFR2 expression. Furthermore, it is supported that recombinant human TNF induced BRAF and MEK inhibitor resistance only in TNFR1 and TNFR2 co expressing BRAF B600E melanoma cell lines. Genetically modified melanoma cell line models indicate that TNFR1 and TNFR2 co-expression is necessary for TNF-induced resistance to BRAF inhibitors. TNFR2 transfected SKML28 cell line displays TNFR2 expression on the cell surface. And furthermore, TNFR2 could be essential to soluble TNF-induced MAP kinase pathway inhibitor resistance and a possible biomarker to identify melanoma patients that could benefit from TNF targeting therapies. Ther therapies. Therefore, targeting soluble TNF may be a feasible strategy to prevent the development and treat a wide range of neoplasms without suppressing any immune response to tumors. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to the Hillman Academy for allowing me to come back again to participate. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Bruno, and the entire Ferris Lab um, for welcoming me and um, engaging in this um, project. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm not aware that it's um, with um, immunotherapy, but I think that'll be interesting to investigate and look at. Um, but I think it's more with the response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any thoughts on why co expression of these receptors is required on that single cell? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but again, I think research will be necessary to look into that as well. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Adam Soloff. Uh, Solway came to the lab uh, seven weeks ago, as all you guys did, and has been an absolute delight to work with. 
Um, she is uh, an accomplished scientist over the past couple couple of weeks, also an accomplished musician. So she's, uh, you know, multi-threat, as we would call it. Um, so I have been absolutely floored by her curiosity and desire to explore these things, these issues. She came in, she picked her own project, really has been instrumental in, in guiding where it wants to go and couldn't say more. It's been terrific. So uh, currently heading into her junior year at Winchester Thurston and whether it's the arts, music or science, I'm sure she's gonna have a tremendous impact on the world. So, uh, I'll let her do her project. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So hi everyone, um, as Dr. Solas said, my name is Sula kaufman Okoko, and over the summer I got the opportunity to work in Dr. Solas' lab. I developed so many new skills with this program. I learned how to grow cell cultures, extract bone marrow from mice, perform different lab experiments, read scientific papers, and so much more. My project is about sex-based differences in environmental regulation of macrophage-mediated cancer immunity. So before I get into the nitty gritty parts of my presentation, I just wanna talk about some big ideas, starting off with epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is the study of how behaviors and environmental factors can change the way a DNA sequence is read, altering a phenotype. So that's a really key thing. It's how the DNA sequence is read, not the actual structure. The structure of your DNA is just something that you naturally inherit, but the environment can change the way that cells process and read that DNA. And so those environmental effects can either be good or in some cases bad. I mean, if you think about things like air pollution, water pollution and contamination, soil contamination, these are things that affect our health negatively. So for my project, we focused on those negative effects. I also wanna talk about macrophages. So macrophages are white blood cells that live in the tissues of our body. They're phagocytic, which means that they basically eat any detected invaders within the body. Um, so that makes them good for fighting but they're also abundant in most tumors. And this is because tumors can develop inflammatory mechanisms in order to survive and grow. And so that's a bad thing. Um, and so for my project, we were growing macrophages and we were testing to see if they would be pro or anti-inflammatory. The next thing I wanna talk about are cytokines. So cytokines are a kind of protein and in general, proteins are good for making up the structure and function of cells. So with cytokines, they help with the growth and activity of immune cells and blood cells by sending signals to the immune cells to indicate the need for responding or fighting. And so we wanted to see if the cytokine production would be different depending on sex-based differences of genes and levels of hormones. So what exactly is the problem? Well, it's known that exposure to certain toxins can lead to cancer. And previous research done in the lab I worked in showed that when exposed to toxins, male and female mice failed to resolve inflammation and fully clean out their lungs. And so you can see in these little, um, little graphs, um, the dark blue bar kind of indicates um, after months how much cytokine production was within the cells and it never went back down to the gray bar. So that shows that their to the toxins were still found in the fluid of the lungs. And so what we wanted to look at is how do macrophages specifically, because these didn't focus on macrophages, but how do the macrophages specifically react when they're exposed to these toxins? And will there be a difference depending on the sexes or hormones? And that just leads me into my hypotheses which is that exposure to certain environmental factors such as pollution and contamination will regulate cancer immunity. And there will be a difference in this regulation depending on sex-based differences such as genes, male and female, and the levels of hormones, specifically estrogen and testosterone. So the materials that we used. First, we had to have cells. And so we got primary cells that were derived from male and female mouse bone marrow. And then we had toxins that we exposed these cells to. And so the toxins that we used were diesel exhaust particulate or DEP. And it's basically this particle that comes from diesel fuel combustion. And then we also used malathion, which is a kind of pesticide. We also used hormones to expose our, our cells to. And so we used estrogen and testosterone for that. And then we used a cytometric beta ray kit and we used this to measure and analyze the cytokine production within the cells. And then using a flow cytometer, we were able to determine and analyze the physical and chemical properties of the cells individually. We also used an EVOS microscope in order to look at cells up close and take photos of them. So jumping into the process, first we had to get the bone marrow. So we took the bone marrow out of, again, male and female mice, and we put it into media. And what media is, is it's basically the solution that keeps cells alive and growing. 
the media that we used was a macrophage stim stimulated media. Um, and it also did not have any extra estrogen. In a lot of medias, there's typically estrogen that is found in it, um, but because we didn't want that to get in the way of the results we were getting, we had to make sure we were using a media that had no estrogen. Then we had to plate these cells. And so the way that we plated them, basically in some wells, we have the control. And what the control is, it's basically the media in the cells without any extra toxins nor hormones. And then we had some wells with the cells dosed with estrogen. And then we had other wells with the cells dosed with testosterone. And then in other three wells, we had all three of those things, the control, the dosed estrogen, and the dosed testosterone, but this time with the toxins. And again, the toxins that we were using were BEP and malathion. So after we plated these cells, we took the supernatant out. And what the supernatant is, it's basically the fluid within the wells. You spin it down in a centrifuge. And then when you take it out, there should be like little pellets of cells at the bottom and then like this liquid at the top. And that liquid is the supernatant. And so we took that and we put it into a cytometric bead array kit. And the way that this works is that there are these beads and they kind of have this styrofoam kind of texture. And these beads have unique and different antibodies. What these antibodies do is they capture the cytokines within the samples. And then we have these detector antibodies that also detect the cytokines. And so what this um, experiment tells us is basically the specific cytokines and the concentration of the cytokines within each sample. Using some more supernatant, we did flow cytometry. The way that flow cytometry works is that the samples are mixed in with the saline solution, and then they come out of this like narrow channel and the cells should be coming out individually and they get zapped by this laser kind of thing. Um, and using light color and intensity of the light and color, we basically were able to see different properties of the cells. And what we were looking at specifically were the expressions of the macrophages to see if they would be anti or pro-inflammatory. So I keep talking about dosing the cells with toxins, but I think it's actually a lot cooler to see it. So here are female bone marrow cells with and without toxins. These ones were dosed with estrogen. So the ones with toxins have all these, all this black gunk on it, which kind of indicates the cells are dying. All right, so jumping into the data we got, um, before I go into like the actual results, I just wanted to show in the top corner, you can see two different graphs. Um, and this is what the cytometric beta ray kit would actually show us. Basically they're all these different markers and the farther right a mark goes, it means the more concentration of the specific cytokine it has. So for our results, um, the first cytokine that we're looking at is called CCL2. And this is a cytokine that basically recruits the immune cells. So in the first graph, what we found were that the male responses tended to decrease from baseline, the baseline being the control, no additional hormones, no additional toxins. Um, and so that means that they had lower concentrations, while the female responses tended to grow from baseline, so they had more concentration. In the next graph, we found that macrophages with testosterone had higher responses with toxin rather than without toxins. And so these were able to recruit cells better when they had toxins present, whereas the macrophages with estrogen were the opposite, and they had higher responses without toxins rather than with. Next up, we looked at IL-6, which is an anti-tumor cytokine. So that means that this is a cytokine that basically fights off the tumors. So in the first graph, we found the same trend. The male responses were decreasing while the female responses were increasing. In the second graph, though, what we found was a bit flipped from before. This time, testosterone had higher responses without the toxins rather than with. And so these were fighting better when they had no toxins present, while the estrogen um, macrophages had higher responses with the toxins rather than without. Next up, we looked at IL-10, which is a pro-tumor cytokine. So this cytokine is actually helping tumors grow and survive. First graph, we found the same trend. Male responses are decreasing, female responses are increasing. But in the second graph, we found that the testosterone and estrogen responses generally stayed the same. So there wasn't something too dramatic to take away from that. Next up, we're looking at the flow cytometry results. So again, just so you guys can see what they would actually look like after um, we did the experiment, at the top, I put a picture. So Basically, we were able to find the, cell, the size of the cells. We were able then to narrow that down to whether or not they were single cells. And then within those single cells, we were able to look at which ones expressed a certain macrophage marker. And then we were able to figure out which ones were pro and which ones were anti-inflammatory. 
So with our results, looking at CD86 first, that is a pro-inflammatory macrophage, meaning that that one is anti-tumor, so it is fighting off the tumors. With this one, we found that there was generally no change between the males versus the females. But we did find that the toxic treatment in females had reduced expression um, than without toxic treatment. The next graph shows a uh, pro-tumor or anti-inflammatory macrophage marker. This is called PDL1. With this one, we found that the females tended to have higher responses than males. We also found, again, that the toxic treatment in females has a decreased expression in comparison to no toxic treatment. Um, and in this one in particular, we found that there was a high female with estrogen expression, and that's the highest bar you see in the graph. We looked at another anti-inflammatory or pro-tumor macrophage. This one was called CD206. And with this one, we found that the females had higher responses than the males, again. Also, the toxic treatment in females tended to reduce expression in comparison to no toxin. So a similar trend as before. So I just showed you guys a lot of data, but what does it actually mean? So what this data tells us is that macrophages with, that were dosed with estrogen have more cytokine production than those dosed with testosterone when exposed to toxins. It also reveals that there are measurable differences between male and female macrophage responses and exposures to toxins and hormones because females have higher responses while males tend to have lower responses. And so you might think, oh, that's a good thing. That means the females are able to fight off any tumors more easily. But it's actually, it can lead to a bad thing because it can lead to chronic inflammation, which then would lead the cells to die. So why should you care? It's a valid question. You should care because this reminds us to be more mindful of the environments we're in. When we're exposed to more toxins, we're at higher risk of getting illnesses and cancer. It also informs us of the level of this risk depending on sex and levels of hormones. And it provides a basis for further research on the topic, which leads me into my future directions. Further research should be done on how to restore immunity after exposed to toxins. And as individuals, we should be developing healthy habits, such as using more eco-friendly vehicles or ways of ways of transportation in order to not be releasing as many toxins. We can also be masking in order to um, reduce the risk of uh, basically taking in a lot of toxins. And we can also be washing and eating a variety of fruits and vegetables so that we're not exposed to pesticides and in particular, a certain kind of pesticide for too long. So before I leave, I just wanted to acknowledge all the people who are on this slide. These were key people, a part of my experience, making it what it was, which was exciting, educational, and engaging. And so I appreciate all the time they took to teach me and offer me with new opportunities. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think that the females would um, probably be more affected and die out a lot easily or a lot easier. Um, when we were actually counting the cells of the um, mice after being exposed, I found that the females tended to have less cells. And so I think that that indicates that they are more prone to death. Yes? That's actually a really good question. I'm not too sure, but um, I'll definitely look into that. Okay. Thank you. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, do you mean like in terms of how they would react when they're exposed to toxins or just? Um, so like you said, uh, with mm -hmm. um, like the I think it would. I think the estrogen definitely um, added on to the cytokine production. And so for that reason, I feel like they would react differently if they had more estrogen present. But it's definitely an interesting thing I'll look into. And if there are no more questions, thank you so much.
Okay. Right up next, we have Camille. Thank you very much. Hey, so Adam again. Uh, so this is Camille. Camille was in the lab as well. Um, I have to say she is also coming in uh, to her junior year at Winchester Thurston. And when thinking about the, the time we've had, the, our scientific journey, the thing that strikes me most about you is just how fearless she was. So she came in and, you know, first couple of weeks we're deciding on projects. There's a big interest in sex-based differences, something that I kind of think is ignored too much. And uh, it, it became apparent in order to do that, you'd have to work with mice, with animals. And Camille just dove right into it. And this is not for the faint of heart, like taking off a leg and getting a bone. I mean, stuff that I didn't do until grad school. And I had surgeons come through the lab that kind of were screamish about it. But she just right into it and just kicked ass. It was great. Um, so beyond being fearless, she's also a ton of input into her project, designed what she wanted to look at, and has really, uh, has really excelled. So she's taken it in new directions, which we will continue in the lab because they are very cool and uh, of great merit. So again, I, I fully expect to see great things out of your career, uh, whether it's a pediatrician or someone along the lines can convince you to become a lab rat. But <laughs> in any case, uh, Hi, my name is Karen Wiley, and I am a rising junior at Winchester Thurston on the Um I'm part of the Hillman Academy and work at the immunology site along with all these wonderful people. Um, so this year, I was I had the privilege of working at the, with the Solop lab along with Solway um, and researching how environmental exposures and sex-based differences regulate macrophage function. So just a little bit of background. So the main question is, how does our environment make us susceptible to lung cancer? So at the top, um, there is a, there's a figure. So it shows a normal lung. And as, it, as the lung cancer progresses, you can see the tumor starts to grow. As the, tumor, as the cancer progresses more, you can see the tumor growing bigger and another tumor also growing along the lung. And tumor metastasis can happen, which is when cells from the original tumor um, basically travel throughout the body through the bloodstream um, and can go to different organs and new tumors can be grown there. So um, because of this, so it's lung cancer, there can be environmental factors such as smoking or air pollution, um, things like that. And so genetic events can also lead to tumors, but we focus more on the epigenetic events. Um, so like beta methylization, histonic modifications, chromatin organizations, and non-coding RNAs. Um, but we've mainly focused on the histone modification part. No, of okay. Um, so another really big part of my project are macrophages. So you heard a lot about them today, but why not give another rundown? So macrophages are immune cells. Um, and they basically promote inflammation and work through a process called phagocytosis, which is where macrophages, macrophages capture and kill pathogens. So there's a little gif at the top that you can see um, the macrophage killing, um, taking in the cancer cell and then breaking it down within. So macrophages, while they can be good things, they can also be a little bit uh, in the sense that they can assist in killing tumor cells or they can also help promote tumor growth. Um, and macrophages can also secrete cytokines with pro-tumor um, properties. And so at the bottom, you'll see that pretty cool rainbow figure, um, which is a macrophage. And those look very similar to which the macrophages I will show you that we've grown. So another really big thing um, about my project is we work with histones. 
So histones are proteins that give structural support to chromosomes. So a chromosome molecule um, of DNA has to fit into the nucleus, and it's really long. Um, you can see like that, that cool background thing. Um, and to fit, the DNA wraps around histones to give chromosomes a more compact shape. So you can kind of think of histones as like cool little grapes, um, and the DNA is like a vine that wraps around them to keep it secure. So um, we work with like the acetylation and methylation of histones, which, which affects their organization and how genes are expressed. So if you think about if the genes altered and the cells altered, then it can cause cancer um, and the organs affected, which can affect the critter or, or human. So there are four different types of histones, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. But in my project, we specifically work with um, H3. So throw a lot at you. So let's just look through basically what the overview of my project is. So my hypothesis is that there will be a noticeable difference in histones from male and female macrophages in, re in response to toxins. So to go about this hypothesis, we did several different things. So we harvested bone marrow from mice, male and female, and cultured them. So at the top, you can kind of see um, just a general idea um, of a flask and little smaller flasks on what we um, put our um, harvested bone marrow from the mice in. Um, we grew macrophages from the bone marrow using MCSF, which is macrophage colony stimulating factor. So you dose them, you dose your freshly um, harvested bone marrow with um, MCSF, and then you put it in the incubator for about five days for the macrophages to grow. So after about that five day period, that's when we begin to plate. So we'll dose our, um, we'll dose our macrophages with toxins. So those being diesel exhaust particulate, um, which is the combustion of diesel exhaust um, and malathion, which is a pesticide. And we also performed histone extraction ELISAs and which is, an ELISA is in the test that detects antibodies. Um, and we also performed histone acetylation, in which, measure, which measures H3 histones. Um, we also performed flow cytometry, which measures the expression of inflammatory and inflammatory genes in our case. So one of my favorite parts, um, the bone marrow extraction. Um, so it's basically when you cut off basically the leg of the mouse. Um, you take the femur, so Tibia, but we work with the femur specifically. <laughs> Can you please mute yourself on the Zooms, please? So um, you take your femur and you have a needle. And so we work with um, PBS to basically flush the um, bone marrow out of the femur. So you flush it to get all the good bone marrow out. Then you, sh then you filter it um, to get like all like the remaining hairs and like the chunks and all that out because you just want the liquid. Um, you centrifuge to get just the pellet, you resuspend, um, and then you plate. So talk about macrophages. Let's see macrophages. So on the, on the left, you can see um, male, be male bone marrow that was not treated with any toxin. Um, you can see how those ones, you can't see any black um, particles or anything like that, so there's no sign of cell death. Um, and so you can tell if it's a macrophage by if it has like little kind of arms in a sense, kind of branching off. Um, our mentor likes to think of them as like a little octopus, which really helps. Um, and then you can look at bone marrow, uh, male bone marrow that was treated with toxins. And you can see the um, black particles specifically from the DP. Um, you can kind of see the macrophages growing. Um, and then you can look at the, macro the female bone marrow that's untreated. And especially in the middle, you can see a lot of the macrophages together. Um, you can see like the little arms out there too. And then the female bone marrow that were toxin treated. You can see the difference because there's a lot more black, so you can see a lot more toxins. So I performed um, histone extractions. And so just a recap again, um, histones are proteins found in chromatin. And so basically the histone extraction isolates the histones. So the DNA wraps around it to form the nucleosomes. And so one big thing is, well, why are we doing this? Why is this important to us? Um, and we're using this to identify if there's a difference in male cells and female cells. 
So previously, my lab did some research um, using RNA sequencing. And so this is to show gene expression in male and female mice. So the light gray at the top, you can see, um, is our female mice. And then the dark gray, you can see our male mice. So these are flow cytometry, and they're showing um, each line, as I see a different gene, there are thousands of genes on there, um, or thousands of lines on there. So basically, these were exposed to toxins um, for one month, which in human years, that's two years. And they're resting for three months, which are 10 human years. Um, and so you can kind of see how the red shows that the genes are turned on. And as you go into the period where they're exposed, they're turned off. And whenever you go into the rest, you might see that they turn back on. So it was interesting to see how, depending on like the control, so not treated with toxins, um, how some genes are turned on and turned off, but when hit with toxins, some genes are turned off and some genes are turned on. So, um, so some results from our histone extraction. So we tested, um, female male mice with toxins and to look at their produc production of H3 histones. So just to kind of go through kind of what each one um, of our samples are. So we have male treated with toxins and then males that weren't treated with toxins. And then you get into female with um, one time the, with the appropriate amount of toxins um, and then female with no toxins and then female with 10 times the amount of DP. Um, and then females with LPS. And so what we saw was that um, females, with, with, females with the appropriate amount of toxins have more than male with the appropriate amount of toxins. Um, and female with no toxins um, had more, showed more histones than male with, to with no toxins. And it was interesting to see that female with toxins had about half the amount of female with no toxins, which can suggest that there was damage to the histones due to the toxins. So once again, so histone acetylation is basically showing gene expression. Um, and so in this, you see very similar results to our histone extractions, whereas um, there are not a drastic difference between male and female um, mice. And you do see that um, there are level, lower levels um, of HG histones whenever they are dosed with toxins and high levels when not dosed with toxins, which would also refer back to the fact that um, this could be because the toxins are promoting cell death. Okay, so we also looked at um, different inflammatory and inflammatory macrophages. So on the left, you can see CD, CD86, um, which is an inflammatory macrophage. And in this, you can see that the female show, show more than the male, whether with toxin or without toxin, but female with toxin and male with toxin female with no toxin and female with toxin showed about the same amount and male without toxin and male with toxin showed also about the same amount to each other. So moving on to CD8, CD2806, which is an anti-inflammatory macrophage. And the female is, shows to be higher than the male, but in this one, you can see that female without toxin and female with toxin um, the levels are a little bit different, and you can also see the same with our male macrophages. So our last one is PDL, PDL1, which is an anti-inflammatory macrophage. Um, and in this, again, it, shows, it follows the same trend where the female is higher than the male. Um, and the toxin, you can kind of see it's a little bit lower than the male control, um, but not a drastic difference. So what can we make of this? Um, there were no drastic differences between male and female cells in the histones, um, but when toxins were added, there were less histones, which can mean that there is damage to the histones um, when toxins were added. Um, and female macrophages in the histone acetylation showed more than male genes, um, in the genes in males, but no drastic differences when those with the toxins. So what can we do in the future? A big thing a part of science is just repeat. Um, and maybe next time using patient cells, whether that be cancerous or not cancerous or and not cancerous. Um, and then also another big thing is being aware of your surroundings. So we're around a lot of pollution in Pittsburgh, but um, just being, you know,
cautious and aware of things that you're breathing in. Um, like Sue said, masking could be a really big thing um, to protect yourself from those harmful toxins. So another big part of science is the part where you mess up. I remember the day that we had a little, uh, um, and our, our um, grad student called it a bad science day, which is really how you can really call it. Um, so we had four results with our histone extractions initially. Um, and with the PCR, our results were not as <laughs> All right. Um, and there were little to no RDNA found um, in our cells. And with our bone marrow, we, as we were counting cells, our cells were dying. So we were wondering why. And so when things like that happen, what you really do is repeat. So we harvested more bone marrow. Um, we looked at supernatin from our, we looked at the supernatin from the mouse cells, looking at cytokine production. And then we also performed flow cytometry through flow gel. Um, I wanna say a big thank you to the Soloff Labs so Dr. Adam Soloff, Amy, Seth, all the people that we worked with, a big thank you to Sue for keeping me through the seven weeks. Um, Dr. Bruno, Dr. Delgoff, um, and all our amazing TAs who've been helping us um, throughout this time. And I wanna give a big thank you to Dr. Michelle Nelson, who referred me to this program and fame for referring me to this program and supporting me throughout this all the time. And a big thank you to my parents who are always there for me and always supporting me. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I think more of the histones themselves just dying because of the toxins or just not being there as much. Um, I'm not 100% sure um, how cell death might affect the level of, of histones, but that'd be really interesting to look into, like the correlation between the two and if there's a difference. Yes. So, uh, I'm like we'll see what you guys do with this in the DMDX. Have uh, you guys worked in doing it in other macrophages, such as um, the other macrophages, especially mm -hmm. with um, the digital drops being, you know, in the DLT group and um, curious to see um, how the toxins affect the other macrophages specifically? We have not, but I think that'd be really cool to look into like different macrophages and seeing if there's a difference in um, the level of system production or just how the cells look. So yeah, I th that'd be really interesting to look into. I think that'd be a good thing for you. Next steps, thank you. Oh, yes. Um, do you know if macrophages express uh, testosterone directly or if they're influenced by other cells That's a good question. I'm not sure. I didn't work as much with um, estrogen and testosterone, so I'm not really positive, but um, I think that again will also be interesting to look into, seeing the correlation. Oh, yes. Was the uh, toxicity level that you used for like the was that from like baseline from the area of or how did you determine how much? Uh, Yes, so we had to count the cells, um, and I know the grad students that we worked with had helped us a lot with like calculating it, but um, it had to do, the amount of toxins that you put has to do with the number of cells that you count um, in the, so my, we're um, taking from one, micro, one milliliter al aliquot, so however many cells were in there, and then there was like a formula, and that would determine how many, how much um, EP and malathion that we would dose it with. Thank you. All righty, so I'm going to need everyone on Zoom to check your mute button and make sure that you are muted as um, someone is disrupting our talks. So please, everyone, just double check that real quick. Okay, uh, so next we have John B. Okay. 
And are you just trying to do the PowerPoint final? Almost. Uh, Hello everyone, uh, I'm Apurva. I'm a postdoc in Cohen Lab. And this summer I got this wonderful opportunity to work with Janvi. And she's super curious. And it was really nice to see her grow in confidence uh, working in the lab. And uh, our lab basically works on lipid metabolism um, in inflammatory diseases. And Janvi has worked on a sub project kind of thing. So, without much further ado, I would like to introduce to you all uh, our lab's terrific T Red. So, over to you, Janvi. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm John G, um, and I'm with Helen Lab, um, and my mentor is Dr. Allison Cohen, and my project was on the effect of serum starvation on regulatory T cells. Okay, so an introduction, what is immunology? It's the, it's the defense of, um, of the body's defense against infection. So there's two major classes of immune cells, myeloid and lymphoid cells. Um, right here, and they both originate from this stem cell. And then our lab focuses on lymphoid cells, um, which include T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. So each cell has their own duties to carry out within the body. So some background on the importance of T cells. They originate in the thymus, and they're part of the adaptive immune system, which means they require time to act against the new antigen. And so there's two different types of T cells. There's CD4 and CD8 cells. Uh, CD4 are the helper cells and CD8 um, are cytotoxic, which kill infected body cells. So um, two main types of T cell behaviors are pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. And diseases that involve dysfunctional T cells um, or dysfunction in pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory functions include HIV, AIDS, anti-inflammatory bowel disease, and cardiovascular diseases. So my project focuses on Tbex, and there's several different types of CD4 cells. Uh, there's Th1, Th2, Th17, and Tbex. Th1, 2, and 17 are all pro-inflammatory in nature, and Tbex are um, anti-inflammatory, which dampen the other's immune cell activities. And Tbregs uh, use lipids for their metabolism and energy. And it's thought that understanding how Tbregs use lipids could help us understand how to use Tbreg therapy in diseases where anti-inflammation is desired. Um, okay, so my hypothesis is, so in previous studies in the Cohen lab, um, we found out that mice, in mice, when Tbregs cannot use lipids, they instead rely on their own lipids for fuel, and that usually um, they become more anti-inflammatory. So uh, my experimental design uh, will test the hypothesis for serum starving uh, by serum starving um, our, and our Tregs, and we'll analyze the physiological changes that occur to the cells at an array of different time points. Um, so does serum starvation affect their survival? So we're going to measure by quantification, quantitation of viability before and after by counting the cells. And does this affect their anti-inflammatory behavior? We'll study specific cell surface markers, transcriptor factors, and cytokines involved in, involved in anti-inflammatory pathways. So my project outline. Um, so we will collect the organs from the wild type mice and then conduct single cell suspension and that will lead us to the enrichment of the cells in complete media and after 24 hours we'll count how many cells we have in the control complete media 
And then we will starve the cells for 24 hours of lipids, of serum. And then uh, we will collect the cell pellet for the, um, flow, the flow cytometry and the supernatant for the ELISA. So um, our method one is cell isolation in culture, uh, harvest the spleen from the mice, single cell suspension, and then we do um, enrichment of CD4 cells via uh, negative selection and then culture the T cells. So negative selection is basically this process where we uh, get, we retrieve our CD4 cells and separate them from the other cells that we don't need using a magnetic uh, magnet. Um, and so the cells that we don't need combine or gather on the side of the tube. And then what we do need is in the center of the tube. Uh, so then we go to our cell counting, which we do by tripen blue staining. Um, and that is just a grid of lines, a glass grid. Um, and we have a formula that we plug our numbers into and that gives us the total number of cells. Um, so before our serum starvation, uh, we had in the wild type control, we had 60% viability of cells and the serum starve had a 30% viability. So wild type control cells were growing much better. And that led us to our flow cytometry. And these are the stains that we used. And then uh, here we see that Fox V3, which is the identification marker of Tregs, it's slightly higher in serum starved conditions, but it's not significant. Um, and then for ELISA, we conducted the sandwich ELISA method. Uh, and ELISA is um, used to measure antibodies, antigens, and protein in sample. So the TMB substrate, uh, the, the development of the blue color is proportional to how much protein is in the sample. Um, so for our results, um, there was little to no um, IL-10, which is the anti-inflammatory cytokine. There was little to no IL-10 in the control sample, but there was a lot um, of IL-10 in the serum starved. So our conclusions for Tregs in serum starved condition, they had less proliferation as well as viability. And we were able to measure the markers of Tregs through flow cytometry. And CD25 had variability in expression uh, through CD4 expression. Though um, CD4 expression was consistent between experimental groups. So FOXB3 expression showed a higher trend under serum starved conditions, but was not statistically significant. NIL10 expression increased significantly, and there was little to no expression in the control cells. So under serum starved conditions, uh, Tregs might be utilizing or burning uh, intracellular lipids to fuel the secretion of anti-inflammatory IL-10, which we detected via ELISA. And understanding how Treg behavior changes due to metabolic fuels may help us develop future Treg therapies for inflammatory diseases like inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease and cardiovascular diseases. Um, and that goes to my acknowledgements. I'm really grateful to be part of such an amazing program. And um, I thank Dr. Cohen for supporting us and a special thanks to Dr. Narain for um, giving me such a wonderful experience and patiently working through with me through this process. I think we did, um, we did do that, but it just depends um, because if there's like serum starvation, um, it led to more FOXB3 expression in serum starvation.
Since we starve them to get more IL-10, I would think we would add more serum to lessen the IL-10. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we are gonna take a quick break until... Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Leah Omer. Uh, this is my project. <laughs> uh, my mentor is Dr. Sawa Ito. And then I just wanna thank all of my lab members, lab team uh, for all their help this summer. So thank you guys. Our question is how can we sensitize target leukemia cells so T, -cell so T cells can better recognize and then later on destroy them? Yeah, it's not <laughs> working. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so why is this important to the study of cancer? The main cancer we're focused on is leukemia. Leukemia is characterized by an overabundance of mutated white blood cells. One of the main treatments is stem cell therapy or stem cell transplant. Uh, however, the issue is that uh, over 50%, specifically 58% of people um, that die at or beyond 100 days after their transplant, die of a relapse of leukemia. So we're trying to lower that number and make uh, the stem cell transplant as effective as possible. So if you look here, <laughs> we're, uh, I know it's a lot for one slide, but we're focused on the GDL. That is the graft versus leukemia effect. And that just means that the donor cells that get put into the recipient's body are actually fighting the leukemia uh, successfully. And this is really important uh, with the minor histocompatibility antigen. HA1 is what we're focused on in this. And it is a specific allo antigen for graft versus leukemia effect. So we are, if you look at the bottom, you'll see the red H on the series of uh, pe the peptide chain. And that H is a single mutation in that line, whereas it, sh it should be R, but it is H. And that's kind of what makes it, um, I guess, recognized as non-self and cancerous. So uh, we're trying to get the donor T cell in the leukemia cells to, uh, we're trying to get the T cell receptor to recognize that with that antigen, but it has to have that, have that transaction for that to occur so it can later on kill it. So uh, interferon gamma uh, stimulates an increase in HLA expression in myeloid leukemia cells in vitro. Um, and this was an earlier study that we're kind of jumping and taking information from to kind of, uh, try to see if we can prime those uh, target cells with interferon gamma so it will uh, kill the target cells better. So um, these are the graphs that just shows that the, of all the cytokines that they tested, interferon gamma, uh, sorry, interferon gamma had the highest like effect. It, it was doing the best compared to the rest of them. So that's why we chose interferon gamma to fight the target cells. Interferon gamma, again, is a cytokine that simulates that anti-cancer immunity. So our hypothesis is that interferon gamma is gonna sensitize those leukemia cells so T cells can better recognize and later on destroy them. So the materials, we use effector cells, uh, HA1, TCR, which is just T cell receptor, transduce, dirt cat cell lines. So if you look, we got the cells from my mother, we cloned them, and then of all of those clones, we took five of them. We took uh, TCR539, TCR9, TCR12, TCR13, and TCR287. But we are focused on TCR539 and 12. We're gonna compare those affinities and see which one is stronger. That, that's what affinity means, like the highest strength. And if you look at the graph, a uh, display of TD69 is on the y-axis, and then on the bottom, the X, is just the amount of the peptide needed. So we want the... Uh, the TCR with the highest affinity is going to have the highest amount of CD69 at the lowest uh, amount of peptide. And that's the one we want. We want the most CD69 at the lowest amount of concentration. <laughs> so our methods, first we're looking for IL-2 and we're gonna do this through an enzyme-linked immunosorbent spot test or an LE spot. So uh, antibodies are added, secreted protein, bioannulated antibody and streptobidin, all that's added. And at the end, you'll see in the middle picture, spots will appear. 
the amount of those spots is the concentration found of IL-2 specifically, because that's the cytokine we're looking for in this. Um, and we're all we're doing this all in vitro, which just means in a subculture. And then uh, I have an IL-2 production here where the T cell is interacting with a leukemia cell. Uh, the way you can see if it, there is a reaction going on is it'll express IL-2. And by counting the number of slots of IL-2 in this LE slot, you can determine how strong of a reaction it is. And then we're also looking for CD69 <laughs> in vitro as well um, through flow cytometry. Oh, it's been smooth full circle, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, <laughs> So we're, with flow cytometry, a few other people have explained uh, so far what it is, but at a single, a single cell will go down a tube and a fluorescent light will shine through it and the fluorescence will be measured and will determine uh, whether it's alive, whether it's dead, whether it's a T cell, whatever, like you can gate and draw a shape around your population to further zoom in. And then uh, we did that so you could see single cells and we continued. And then you can see which ones have an H peptide, which just means they have that mutation versus the ones with an R peptide, which means they don't. Or no peptide, meaning there's nothing going to happen. There's nothing there. On the right, I showed a picture of the light source hitting through a cell. And then we are looking for CD69, which is a protein in this case, uh, to determine the expression, the uh, uh, strength of reaction. So uh, <laughs> I was going to present, and then the red lines would kind of come in as I explained that those two rows should have no, nothing should appear as they are negative controls. So they should just be blank, but we're not doing it in present, uh, presentation mode just because Zoom isn't working, but that's okay. So the third row is going to have our reaction because we have that H peptide, which is that uh, peptide that is cancerous or has that mutation. So we're going to see a reaction there. And then at the bottom, the PMAs are positive controls, which is, should appear as a dark red color. Uh, if the experiment is working correctly. And then we also have negative controls as a T cell receptor with nothing else in it, no stimulation, it's not gonna do anything. So these are the results for the LE spot TCR affinity. If you look at the uh, triangle, not triangle, I'm sorry, the rectangle, the rounded rectangle surrounding those wells, you'll see that the first two rows, like I said, are negative controls. There are no spots, nothing happened, no reaction. But then the next one, it is immunogenic. It did produce a response. And because it has more dots, than the ones later on than the other half of the plate, then T cell receptor 539 had a higher affinity than the other T cell receptor 12. And then again, I just wanted to show the positive controls are dark red, meaning that they positively <laughs> reacted and there's a positive control there to kind of display that. And then uh, T2 and THV1 again are the leukemia cell lines that we're kind of using as targets here. And then LCL1 and LCL2 are also uh, leukemia target cell lines. Um, and if you look at that, the first four wells have a higher reaction with the last third row in the second picture than the other four wells, meaning that that TCR539 uh, is has a higher affinity than 12. And then I also show just how drastic the change is between uh, what's in orange, the TCR539 versus blue TCR12. So you can see that TCR12 has a way lower affinity than TCR539. So moving forward, we are going to sensitize these cells with interferon gamma. So we're going to sensitize T2, THP1, LCL1, and LCL2 with that, uh, and then use TCR539 to try to fight those cells and see what happens. Because we chose TCR539 only because we determined previously that it had the highest affinity. And we're looking for an expression of CD69. My hypothesis was that the target leukemia cells will be sensitized to the interferon gamma, and that will result in a more immunogenic response, and later on the T cells will better recognize and destroy those cells. So these are the results. Uh, if you look at T2 with and without priming um, with interferon gamma, there doesn't seem to be like much of a change. It appears to be having the same amount of CZ69 uh, like with and without interferon gamma, but if you look at THP1 without interferon gamma at the top, it's declining, the CD69 levels are just dropping and that's without any stimulation, without anything, it's just not effectively working. But with interferon gamma, you'll see that it is improving. In fact, at a higher concentration, it's doing a lot better and the CD69 is, is increasing. So our hypothesis was true that the cells will be sensitized to interferon gamma and there will be a higher reaction. And that reaction is measured through the T cell receptors expression of CD69. Since that CD69 is increasing, we know that that reaction is increasing, that the strength of that reaction is increasing. 
And then if you just look up close at T2, um, it does appear that they are like about the same once they level out. And that's true. Once they level out, once they reach their maximum like amount of CD69, that's all they're going to get. But if you look at a smaller uh, dosage of peptide, you'll see that T2, or I'm sorry, you'll see that T2 with interferon gamma is doing better than regular T2. It just, as you get to that higher dose, once it reaches its capacity for CD69, that's all it's going to do. And then if you look at THP1, THP1 with interferon gamma is doing way better than regular THP1. And then there's a clinical application going on for this, uh, for post-transplant relapse. And that's the clinical trial there if you want to search that to learn more about it. Um, but basically at week zero, patients are uh, injected with interferon gamma. They prime after 48 hours. And then uh, the donor lymphocyte infusion is given at week four. Uh, three out of the four patients are in ongoing complete remission. It successfully worked. However, sadly, one of the patients passed away as he was not able to get the donor lymphocyte infusion in time. That brings me to my work cited and then also acknowledgement. So a special thank you to my mentor, Dr. Sawa Ito, and then my whole lab team. So thank you, Ray and Vizlas and everyone. And I also want to thank uh, my teachers that recommended me for this program, my parents, my family, uh, Dr. David Doon, Stephen uh, Livschitz, or I'm sorry, Stephen Jones, Solomon Livschitz, um, Dr. Tolia Bruno, Dr. Greg Zelgoff, and all the TAs for their help and advice on my presentation. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay, so uh, so this is the TCR sequencing data. So we use TCR 539 and TCR 12, and those numbers are just given based on the uh, the number of cl uh, whatever clone they were that we took from the mother and cloned. So uh, these are the clones 539, uh, 287, 12, 13, and 9. So you'll see them on the left side of the sample name. And then as you continue down, those TRBV, TRBJ, those are just like different things that differentiate because every single T cell in the body and in every, um, and in people are very differentiated. So like you might start at TRBV79, like all of them, but then you might become, you know, TRBJ2-5 uh, or whatever. Like every single cell, every single T cell is different. It's going to differentiate. Those receptors are not going to be the same among all of them. So what we had to do was we had to take the one with the highest affinity. So that was what our first experiment was, was determining, okay, which one has the highest affinity? Take that cell and then do our experiment with interferon gamma. So you don't really know which one's going to have a higher affinity until you actually do the test. Uh, but this is the sequencing data, which just shows the differences between them. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So uh, why clone these cells from a pregnant woman? Well, if you look, the mother is HLA-A0201, which is just like the HA1 mehop specific thing. Um, and she was RR, uh, which means she had no mutations, everything was fine. But her child was HR, which means there was maybe potentially like that uh, mutation. And it could really go either way. If it's HR, it's almost like a dominance with the H. Um, but it also could like be, I don't want to say it's always going to be like cancerous. Uh, there's like that, I guess, uh, variation like it could or won't always be. Um, but basically, the minor histocompiled ability antigen is recognized as a non self antigen. And we isolated those from the T cells that were uh, naturally immunized with, her, immuni immunized with her child. So we took those, um, like the stem, we took the cells. <laughs> I don't know how to explain this. Um, we, we just took them because they were naturally immunized with her child. Um, and then we just cloned them and we got the five. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you guys. <laughs> Okay, 
right, and then our final presentation will be from Helen today. So which one is yours? Gotcha. So we should be still sharing, same thing. Okay, I don't know why it's not. Hi, my name is Brandon Nicolidis. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Goshawk wasn't um, able to make it today. Um, today, I'm introducing Helen Zhang, who joined our lab this summer and got to work with us um, um, working with our new uh, fluorescent recording mice. And she's going to um, present what she did today. Uh, she, we were happy to have her this summer and sad that it ended too soon. Um, so Helen, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Brandon. So, um, hi, my name is Helen Zay. This summer, I worked in the lab of Dr. Rachel Gottschall with her assistant, along with um, Carson Sugar, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. And um, as before, mentioned before, I'm Brandon Michaelis. And my project is called Quantifying Macrophage Inflammatory State Using a Novel Reporting Mice. So before we really get into the methods and materials, we kind of under, have to understand what a macrophage is. And I obviously know this is going to be quite a bit of reiteration, but just bear with me. So, um, crap, is this, um, the errors? Oh, it's still not working. Sorry for the whole Oh, no. Thank you. Um, so just to um, put it simply, um, macrophages are a type of myeloid, a my, type of myeloid monocyte derived phagocytic white blood cell responsible for a variety of different functions based on their environment. So, um, so some basic information about them, they are a part of the um, innate immune system, which is kind of considered like the first um, line of response to any pathogen. So it's kind of a, your immediate response within the first zero to 96 hours. And basically um, the most abundant macrophages, which were um, the focus of our study were um, alveolar macrophages. And these um, are found in the lungs and they deal with um, pathogens in air spaces, which makes sense logically because um, you're always breathing in stuff and or you're always breathing. And when you're breathing, you, um, you also breathe in a host of pathogens. So that's why they're so abundant and they're just always dealing with the pathogens that you breathe in. But um, hearkening back to the point of um, different functions based on their environment, there are many types of macrophages. These are just the macrophages we focused on, but um, they can be classified on a functional spec, this function spectrum. And basically this goes from um, M1 over there, which is um, pro-inflammatory and M2 on the other side, which is anti-inflammatory and associated with tissue repair. But the thing about um, this, although we know that this functional spectrum exists, sorry, we don't really have the tools to really quantify or track this. But what we do know is there that there are these, there are biomarkers, which to put it simply, is just something found that is an indicator of a processor condition. So in this case, the processor condition could be um, that we're focusing on is the um, M1, M1 state, which is um, the inflammatory state. So um, this can be certain molecules that can be found at certain times. And um, in our case, it's a, in our case, there is um, a gene that is expressed called, uh, that, a gene that's associated with um, the M1 phenotype and it's called um, FTH1. And what it does is, it includes a heavy subunit of ferritin, which is a major iron cell storage. So I know for uh, specifically for tumor cells, just to give an example, tumors are often nutrient poor environments and they lack oxygen. So this can help, help um, macrophages protect themselves from an early cell death. So 
because 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 they are in this inflammatory response when response when they're in a tumor, you're going to see um, a high higher levels of FTH1 expression than normal, and basically higher ferritin levels. So in this case, so in this case, ferritin or the expression of FT, the high, heightened expression of FTH1 would um, serve as our biomarker. And so we wanted to track this. So um, to track this, my lab, um, we made these um, reporter mice, which throughout this experiment, we've called, um, referred to it as um, FTH scarlet, so you can see it in any of the graphs. Just know that that is our reporter mice. So basically, what makes this mice different is that there is a gene inserted into it that we use CRISPR to insert it, and it, it codes for a fluorescent protein called M scarlet. And as you can see over there, there is um, a diagram of our gene in the DNA. So um, as you can see, there's M scarlet and then a cleavage point in between there. And then after that is the FTH1, is the FTH1 gene. So basically this allows for um, M scarlet and FTH1 to be produced simultaneously with one piece of mRNA. So basically they're produced in unison. So equal amounts, so FTH1 and um, M scarlet are basically directly proportional. So this kind of allows us to like track it, track it because e there are equal amounts of FTH1 and M scarlet. So it kind of allows us to track or like report it, which is um, the point of our mouse. But um, we have to um, make sure this, obviously this is great in theory, but we have to um, make sure that this mouse is working and that the um, our reporter is working. So that's kind of the main focus of my project, which is, um, validation, which is validation testing. And the method we're going to use for um, validation testing, this time, this for this, ex for this study, we've mainly focused on um, close cytometry as our main method. So basically what we've done is um, harvest uh, lungs and bone marrow. So lungs because alveolar macrophages are in the lungs and um, bone marrow because mo macrophages are derived from monocytes, but there are also some like other immune cells, so neutrophils, and then we um, stain them for um, those, those, we stain them for those proteins right there, which are unique to the whatever immune cell we're looking for. So after, so basically after staining, we basically ran them through a flow cytometer. And what the flow cytometer gave back to us was basically flow data. And from there, as many of my peers have mentioned, you can gate on it for certain populations and analyze them first certain um, M scarlet for certain approach for certain things that are present and not present. So for our case, we would be gating for certain cell populations and analyzing them for M scarlet intensity. And um, all of this for, we did all of this with our um, FTH1 M scarlet mouse, but we also did it with um, all adulterated mice. So mice that didn't have the gene inserted to them, they were just regular. And we referred to them as like wild types, abbreviated WT. And basically, these served as our controls. So we would compare the compare like FT, the FTH1 reporter mice and um, the wild type to see if there was any difference. So um, then after, so basically, our objective of this, just to reiterate, is to analyze the novel FTH1 M scarlet mice, lung and bone marrow for M scarlet intensity using Flojo and flow cytometry. And um, my hypothesis for this is that um, there will be a noticeable difference in M scarlet intensity between FTH1 M scarlet mice and W and well type mice in macrophages. So after get do, after harvesting the lungs and do it and um, running them through through a flow cytometer, we then got to um, flow gating. So initially, what it gives you is um, this, which is just like the forward scatter and side scatter, and then all of your cells here and how, wherever it plots. So basically um, forward scatter measures size and side scatter measures granularity. So basically it, during, in the flow cytometer, there's a lot of other things that we really don't, um, that the flow cytometer also examines that we don't like really care for. So like debris is also one of them. So here we're trying to sort out um, debris so anything that's just like very outlying or like really granular, we can kind of tell that it's not really like a cell. So we gated for specific population. So we gated for then cells. And then after that, we sorted for um, single cells. And after that, um, we gated for immune cells. So all immune cells have a protein called CD45. 
And basically we can see CD45 in the Y axis right there. So basically um, any, cell, any cells that are CD45 positive, we immediately know that they're immune cells. So after that, we're um, gonna sort on the antibodies we, the antibodies sort on um, the antibodies that we use to stain them and, stain, and look for um, the proteins we're looking for. So right there uh, on the, um, on the um, farther to closer to the arrow, you can see that's our alveolar macrophages and the proteins we were looking for were um, Figlic F and CD11C and macrophages and alveolar macrophages specifically are Figlic F positive and CD11C positive as well. And as you can see there, we really didn't do like all of it, but we didn't like do all of the cells that were CD11C positive and Figlic F positive. But what you can notice right there is that um, really specific populations are starting to form. So we basically kept narrowing it down and instead of, we made it a lot more precise as we went. So that's why there's, it's not just all of the cells that are positive in the two proteins we're looking for. We're really starting to focus on in on these specific populations that you can see visually. And then um, for the same, same um, body of immune cells over there, um, we um, looked at cells that were, we looked for um, CD11B, protein, the protein them CD11B and Ly6G. And basically um, we then gated for our neutrophils, which were positive in both, but then we also gated for cells that were Ly6G negative, but CD11 positive, which was a subset, which was a subset and not necessarily just like a population of cells. But um, after gating for that, um, we then um, we then looked for CD. We then looked for Ly6C among those cells, and any cells that were positive in that, we determined we could tell that um, that was our monocytes. So um, so how did so how did the M scarlet levels look in all the cell populations? Well, first let's start with um, our alveolar macrophages, which were our focus. So. On the x-axis, you can just see like um, the y-axis is just how many cells are how many cells are in like each like intensity level, and then the y-axis is and then the x-axis, excuse me, is measuring the M scarlet. So as you can see here, there's a very noticeable difference, like almost like very stark. And so that was that um, fit my um, hypothesis hypothesis that there was a noticeable difference between. Um, FTH1 M scarlet and wild type and macrophages. And it kind of took, and initially took me by surprise because these mice hadn't been stimulated with any pathogens. This was just a mice as it was. It hadn't been, in, the cells hadn't been infected or stimulated with anything. But then I also remember that you're constantly breathing, you're also constantly breathing and with that you're inhaling pathogens as well. So kind of like, Considering that information, it kind of makes more sense because these are the main macrophages of your lungs. So, um, yeah, so basically after reasoning through it, it kind of made a bit more sense, like why this was like so high and so stark. And then we also um, gated for um, neutrophils and um, monocytes in the bone marrow. And so looking at this, um, you can see that our AMs, ovular macrophages are here again, but we're also comparing them with um, neutrophils this time and monocytes, which are right here. So as you can see, they kind of still, you can see that there's still, um, there's still like quite a bit of difference between um, the wild type and um, the FTH and the reporter mice in terms of M scarlet levels. So we know that the reporter is working for other cells, but uh, one thing to note is that um, the um, extra, like the um, starkness, or I guess like the polar polarness of like the results for like the ovular macrophages didn't hold up in the other cells. So um, we so from this we can we know that um, ovular macrophages there are the primary um, primarily use ferritin or primarily like express FTH one as their main source of iron. But we also know that other cells, other immune cells like neutrophils and monocytes um, use them as well. And, um, but just not as, um, not as intensely or not as much as um, alveolar macrophages. So um, now that we know this, um, what can we do with this? 
So um, first we should um, do more validation testing. This was data collected from only one mouse. So we should be doing this with the multiple mice that we um, produced. And we also, and we were able to do this, but we are currently analyzing the results, but um, we should do a stimulation with the FTH1 M Scarlet in the wild types because we did the mice just as they were, just as they were like living. So we should um, test them. We should um, test them with um, a pathogen and see how like the monocyte and like see the um, M Scarlet levels and M Scarlet levels and the mice afterwards and see if there's like a change, if it like spikes up since like, obviously that that's like a mounted immune, immune response versus um, you're just like living as, you're just like going on life as normal. And um, the thing we also have to determine if um, M Scarlet even accurately reports the FTH1 gene expression. And how we would do this is we would run um, a qPCR and see how much like mR mRNA is being produced at one time. So if so, if if it does accurately report it, then the M Scarlet levels and um, the FTH1 expression levels should be proportional as like they're going up in case as they're going up or like over time, they should be proportional and one shouldn't be like really high or they should be consistent during, and we would do this like during simulations. So we would know um, basically if there, if there, it's a more intense response, there should be more M Scarlet and there shouldn't be a same, the same levels of M Scarlet just for like, bit, just for like normal response and like a stimulation response. And then um, we need to determine with the information on neutrophils and monocytes, we kind of have to determine if um, FTH1, the reporter mice is indicative of a broader inflammatory gene expression because we obviously know like macrophage, like alveolar macrophages, it's kind of working, but um, for monocytes, but it also didn't just like tell us the M1, phen it didn't just tell us about the M1 phenotype in macrophages, it told us um, about many other cells. So we kind of have to figure out whether it's macrophages, just macrophages that can, that can work for this, or if it's just a wide range of cells in a broader inflammatory state. So um, that's the end of my um, project. So um, here are my sources and um, special thanks to um, Rachel, Go Rachel, Dr. Gottschalk and um, Carson and Brandon for obviously being the main people involved, Rachel for advising and Carson and Brandon for sh showing me the in and outs of the labs and how to do these techniques. And also to the rest of the Gottschalk lab, I'm Sonia Morgan and Neha, who were also like, were really helpful with my presentation and giving back feedback. And also people from neighboring labs who were just um, willing to assist in case like people were in a meeting or like they were busy and helping me with like flow and some other stuff and just being willing to, to talk about like just random stuff in general but also like their scientific backgrounds because a lot of them come from like a variety of backgrounds so like how so many people with such diverse backgrounds got into the same point and um also to the TAs Bridie, Ian, Stephanie and to the site heads Tuli and Greg and also to um the Hillman Academy and Dave, David, um, Solomon and Stephen for just giving me the opportunity to um, do this wonderful experience and um any questions? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So um, I know that earlier when you were trying to do the PCR, I thought like early on. Um, and did you not work out? But what happened? Um, yeah. So the we actually did this on two mouse. This was just the main results we used, but that mouse actually had like it wasn't mod it wasn't modified properly like the other mouse, so it actually had an error in it. And I do still have um I have some basics about QCCR here, but I also have the data. So um this was the faulty M Scarlet that we did earlier. This sample right here is degraded, so it's like the RNA mRNA is not very good. So like it's not really an accurate description. But as you can see here, these were all stimulated. And um, during the immune response, and these were like given, so basically these were the um, 
numbers were how much time they were given for an immune response before um, we analyzed them. So as you can see, the um, wild type had um, an, a spike in FTH1 expression versus um, the and Scarlet, which didn't really have any, it just kind of plateaued. So we did have the results, but the mouse was also faulty. So, yeah. Oh, sorry, Bradley. Can you maybe tell us um, why the cells were blocked for the iron? Place. Well, um, I kind of guess like the main point I made earlier is main point I made earlier, especially for like, um, well, um, for this case, because they were unstimulated, it's just like the pathogens we breathe in, we kind of come in with not necessarily like bacteria or like diseases that would cause sickness, but like just general like harmful things we always come in contact with. So that's why like they're at the um, scarlet expression is always up, but also like iron also, like in um, tumors, the earlier example, um, because it's so nutrient poor, cells would just like to have iron to like protect them from premature like cellular death or like um, insufficient nutrition. So stuff like that. So if you're in an environment that's really nutrition poor, like a tumor, like a tumor, like that's why so some cells would want to like store iron. Right. So that concludes our student presentations. I just want to thank everyone for coming out. Um, I want to thank the mentors and the parents for supporting our amazing students and the students themselves for doing such a great job. We're super proud of you. Um, it's incredible you guys are starting your research journey this early. Um, and you probably learned that it's a little bit difficult sometimes. So I want to leave you with my favorite paraphrase quote from Thomas Edison that's, uh, I have not failed. I found 10,000 ways that won't work. Um, so just keep trying and uh, you guys have an amazing head start already. So great job. <laughs>